So, good morning, everybody. Um, can you guys do me a favor? This is the first time I've done one of these, and my mom is watching. Um, would you guys take a selfie with me? Just, I have to. Yeah, I, I have to. Thanks. Um, so my name is Jeremy Hayes. I am a DevOps engineer with Leatrio. Very excited to be here in Columbus. Um, so I live in Boston, but I'm actually from Iowa, you know, the other state with three vowels and a consonant. So we don't do that O-H, I, I don't know. But um, so it just feels a little bit like, uh, like coming home to me. Um, so uh, if you want to know more about Leatrio, check out our booth. Uh, but that's not why I'm up here today. Today, I want to talk to you about creating a culture of inclusion. And doesn't that just sound really nice, like world peace or free donuts? Um, and there are lots of reasons that this is important to me personally. In my past lives, I've been a queer activist, a social justice educator, an out gay man, and somebody who really just cares about people. But then I became a father, and now, these two little darlings um, drive everything that I do, and they have me thinking a lot about what I can be doing to make the world a better and safer place for them. Because let's face it, we live in a world where people are treated differently because of who they are and how they look. People like to say that we live in a colorblind society or that we've moved beyond seeing race, but often the people who are saying that aren't the people who experience racism every day. And we've all seen headlines about the diversity problem in tech. A lot of us in the room have probably felt it ourselves. And whether that's because you've personally experienced discrimination or just feeling left out, or you've looked around your organization and noticed, wow, everybody here looks just like me. Or conversely, nobody here looks like me. According to research from Glassdoor, 67% of job seekers consider the workplace diversity when they're looking at job opportunities. And more than 50% of employees want their workplace to do more to increase diversity. But what we know is that just getting more people with different characteristics into the room isn't enough. It's a start, don't get me wrong, but we need to take a hard look at the culture and what we're doing or not doing to be truly inclusive. When I talk about a culture of inclusion, I mean a place where organizational customs, beliefs, and actions truly honor and welcome all individuals, where factors like race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability status, mental health, religion, ethnic and cultural background, socioeconomic status, all these things, don't prevent someone from being fully involved. A place where people are not just invited in, but are truly made a part of the organization. So today, I want to suggest to you some things that you can do to help create that culture in your own organizations. First of all, just be yourself. You are valuable. You bring a unique set of talents and perspectives to your organization. And you should feel comfortable bringing all those aspects of your identity to work with you. When we are all our whole, authentic selves, we make it easier for others to do the same. And if we're going to truly value difference, we have to make it visible. When our culture is truly inclusive, the parts of our identity that make us unique become common and ordinary rather than strange or exotic. For example, I talk about my husband in casual conversation just as much as my coworkers talk about their opposite sex partners. It should be completely normal to ask for an adjusted work schedule during Ramadan when you're fasting. I attended HashiConf earlier this month, and I heard a HashiCore engineer there talk about how he unintentionally triggered a movement within the organization that led to the creation of pride stickers and other swag just because he asked for it. He wanted to be visible as a queer person in tech, and by doing so, he created a space that made it easier for others to do the same. It's not always easy, especially if you feel like you're the only person like you. But sometimes I think you'll be surprised what you'll find when you ask. And if you work at an organization that doesn't respect you for who you are, 
try to find the allies in the organization who can help you bring about the change. And if that doesn't work, maybe it's time to look for a different place. Now, for some of us, that's easier said than done. I know that I'm speaking from a place of privilege as a cis white male pretty established in my career, and not everyone can take those kinds of risks. The second thing you can do is be mindful of the words you use every day. Like Courtney said when she was talking about her maxims, vocabulary matters. And I'm not talking about political correctness. I'm talking about being aware of the language that you use and how it might impact other people. For starters, try using gender neutral terms. I have a coworker from California who calls everybody dude or bro. Every sentence either starts with dude or ends with bro. And he's trying really hard to change, but like any other habit, it's hard to break. <clears throat> or take my husband as an example. His father, and I'm sure many other fathers, taught him that the polite way to address a group of women is to say, ladies. But that can be perceived as diminutive or condescending, and you also don't know if everyone in the group actually identifies as a lady. There are lots of alternatives, and it takes practice. I encourage you to try it out this week, but you have to give yourself permission to make mistakes, because that's what matters, the trying. That's what signals, hey, I get it, and I'm working on being inclusive. It's not about being perfect and getting it right all the time. And it's okay to stop and correct yourself mid-sentence. Even that opens up the opportunity for further dialogue. And I can't talk about gender-inclusive language without mentioning pronouns. Um, with singer Sam Smith recently announcing their pronouns, it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment. Um, sometimes when you go to conferences, you'll notice people with their pronouns on their badges. Um, and it, it's a way to, uh, we need to respect people and how they choose to identify. And it's another opportunity to make things more visible. I've started including my pronouns in my email signature, on my Twitter bio. When everyone is explicit about their pronouns, including people whose gender isn't really called into question, it actually makes it more comfortable for someone who, who identifies as non-binary or someone whose presentation might not match their pronouns to self-identify and ask to be called what they want. The third thing you can do is get to know people as individuals and treat them as such. You are a complete, complex person with a multifaceted identity, and so are all your coworkers. So try not to rely on stereotypes that are based on someone's appearance or background and let those determine how you interact with them. At the end of the day, we are all individuals with our own unique blend of nature and nurture that governs how our personalities manifest. When we start treating some people differently or excluding them, we miss out on the value that they bring to the organization. A good friend of mine, Vernon Wall, who is a diversity trainer, talks about the tape recorder that plays in our head. Now, for you youngins in the room, think of a Spotify playlist. These are all the messages that we picked up as we were growing up, whether it's from our families or school, church, wherever. These are all the things that you noticed, even subconsciously. Maybe it was observing how people were being, being treated differently based on how they looked or where they were from, or even explicit messages like being told that a particular group is lazy or women belong in the kitchen. All those messages were recorded on the track in your head, and now it's just constantly playing in the background. So when you see someone who looks a certain way walking down the street, without even thinking about it, you draw on those messages and make assumptions about that person. That's unconscious bias. It's hard to undo that programming because it's often rooted in, in fears or superstitions or ignorance. And usually the people we got it from are the people that we grew up trusting and believing more than anybody else. My husband likes to talk about the, the messages he got from his mother where you know, she contends that anybody who doesn't like animals is evil and you can't trust men who wear pinky rings. These are silly, right? They're not true, th true things, but the unconscious bias is still there on some level. You can undo this. It requires a lot of self-awareness. It can be helpful to ask your colleagues or friends what they think your biases are. Having open and honest conversations about the biases that other people see in us can help to reveal our blind spots. And you can work on this over the next couple days, too. 
try to notice when you make an assumption about somebody that you don't know and think about where is that coming from? What are the messages that are playing in your head? According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, about one in five adults in the US experience mental illness in a given year. Some mental illnesses are more debilitating than others, but the reality is that most of us will be impacted by our mental health in some way. This can include you know, illnesses like depression or anxiety, and also neurodevelopmental disorders like learning disorders or autism. The fourth thing you can do is practice empathy and compassion for your coworkers who might be struggling with these issues. For most of us, our jobs are stressful, but it's usually a positive kind of stress that challenges us to improve and get better at our work. We need to understand that we all come to work with different experiences and needs. For me, standing up here and doing public speaking is stressful. I mean, just check my heart rate monitor. But for someone with, with anxiety, it can be really hard and almost impossible. Uh, James Meikle uh, did a great presentation about this at uh, DevOps Days in Boston last year, and there's a, there's a link to the recording of that in the slides here. The uh, open, source mental, uh, open Sourcing Mental Illness is a great resource as well. They've got a lot of videos and resources on their website that you can check out about mental health and tech. Talking openly about mental health can help to reduce the stigma around it and contribute to a more inclusive culture. I tell pretty much anybody who will listen that between my husband and me, we see two individual therapists and a couples therapist every month. The CEO of my company talks openly about his, he and his wife's therapy and likens it to getting an oil change. Be sure to take the time for self-care. We all know that burnout is a real thing. If your company allows for mental health days or offers unlimited PTO, take advantage of those days when you need it and be as open as you feel comfortable with your supervisor about your needs. Fifth, pay attention to the people in your organization whose voices and perspectives are marginalized. It's likely not even intentional. How many times are you sitting in a meeting and a woman presents an idea, two minutes later a male colleague says basically the same thing, right? Those of us with privilege have a responsibility to take notice of that and do something about it. So the next time that female colleague presents something, chime in with, hey, that sounds really interesting, tell us more. We can't expect someone who is being marginalized to always be able to advocate for themselves. So check in with your colleagues and see how they're doing, and what they're feeling. It's important to have a working environment that is accessible to individuals with physical disabilities, but creating a welcoming space goes beyond just that. Instead of thinking about just accommodations, look at inclusive design, which focuses on making environments universally accessible and looks beyond disability. Think about what someone with different needs from you might need and make that the norm rather than the exception that they have to request. That not only helps the person who might need that accommodation, but it is also a clear signal of inclusion. Make slide decks and websites that are easy to read for people with low vision. Provide trainings in a variety of modes for people with different learning styles. Encourage your company to have lactation rooms, nap rooms, prayer or meditation rooms to make your space more welcoming for everybody. The goal is to make sure that everyone is able to fully participate. If you're involved in the hiring process in your organization, take a critical look at your processes. How diverse is your candidate pool? How could you be actively recruiting uh, candidates who have traditionally been underrepresented? Remember that unconscious bias, that Spotify playlist playing in your head? Be really mindful about that in your interview process. For example, there's research that indicates that those with ethnic sounding names in Western countries are less likely to even be selected for an interview just on the basis of their name on their resume than those with Western names. Notice when you're evaluating candidates differently based on their identity. If you see a female candidate and a male candidate exhibit the same behavior, do you treat them differently? Make sure that your evaluation criteria are objective and consider having anti-bias training for your recruiting teams and hiring managers. 
often at conferences like this, we have codes of conduct like they showed earlier that call out what behavior is acceptable and what isn't. Encourage your organization to have one too and to make it public. People who are likely to experience harassment or have experienced it before are more likely to join your organization if they feel it's gonna be a safe place for them where harassment won't be tolerated. The 2018 Women in the Workplace report found that only 27% of employees say that managers regularly challenge biased language and behavior when they observe it. Only 40% say that disrespectful behavior toward women is, is called out. And just 32% think their company swiftly acts on claims of sexual harassment. But it's not just sexual harassment we need to be aware of. Don't tolerate jokes about mental disorders or biased language about women or racial groups or LGBT people. When you see behavior that's inappropriate or disrespectful, speak up. Change won't come if we're all silent. Finally, take the time to learn about the experiences of people who are different from you. Look for books, podcasts, blog posts from a variety of perspectives. The uploaded slides for this presentation have links to some suggested resources that you can check out as a starting point. So, Thanks for being here today. I hope you took away something that can help you and your organization be more inclusive. Um, check out this link to give me your feedback. If you don't get the Pearl Jam reference, I can't help you. Um, I'll be hanging out at the Leatrio booth this afternoon, so come by if you want to chat some more about this. Thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>